if you would turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to read just um, four verses, chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, and um, um, the title of my message is Inheriting a Blessing, that is the promise of God to us, and, and, and Peter talks about that here as the motivation for folks um, to continue to follow and serve the Lord. But let's read um, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life in secret days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You know, people have sought the blessing of God since the beginning of time. You know, anyone going through a difficulty, you know, if they know someone who's a Christian, uh, they'll say, can you pray for me? I just need God's blessing in this endeavor. And, and, and you know, there's a, 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 a kind of a natural thing within our each one of us that we want to be blessed by God. You see, God's blessings empower us. They heal, they release His provision, um, the blessing is not just simply a word, but God, because God's word is creative. It's through his word that physical creation came. And when God releases a blessing, there's power in that. Adam and Eve began their life with the blessing of God. That's the first thing that happened to them. Because in Genesis 1.28, it says, And God blessed them, and then said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and fill it and have exercise dominion over all the creation. But it started with, and God blessed them. They needed that blessing in order to empower them to fulfill God's will. Abraham left Ur because of God's blessing. God appeared to him and he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. It's the Abrahamic covenant. It's in Genesis chapter 12. And he says, I'm going to bless you and make your name great so that the blessing I give you will flow through you and bless all the nations of the earth, all the people groups of the earth. And we know that that is true in Jesus. And then Abraham passed that blessing on to Isaac, who passed it on to Jacob, who passed it on to his 12 sons. <coughs> you see, when we receive the blessings that we have in Christ, there's a direct line all the way back to the blessing that God gave to Abraham. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we receive God's blessing. We receive it today. And we receive a promise that we will inherit his blessings in, in the times to come. Knowing that we are blessed of God enables us to live our lives for God's glory. I'll tell you what, if, if you have to work to get God's blessing, well, we'll never get there. But God's blessing comes by grace, and when we receive God's blessing, it can't be taken away. We receive it, we have it, we are the blessed of God. That changes the way we look at the world and the way we live. Inheriting God's blessings is the motivation that Peter talks about here in terms of living a life in the way of Christ. And he begins this passage in verse 8. He says, finally, all of you. Now, he's concluding a section that we've been looking at in terms of, uh, of his teaching to Christians in very challenging situations. You know, the church living under a 
a foreign government that didn't recognize Yahweh as God. Uh, slaves who had to submit to their masters. Uh, women, Christian women, wives who were in relationships with unbelieving husbands and how to handle that. And he comes to the very end and he says, finally, everyone, all of you, he's talking to the church. And he's bringing conclusion to, to this type of teaching of how do we live in relationship with one another. And he says, um, gives us five things that we can do in order to be a blessing. Living in the blessing of God and being a blessing to one another in the church. And it's very powerful exhortation. See, he, he kind of does them in, in, in machine gun fire, you know, rapid staccato fire. And he says... First, live in harmony with one another. You know, be sympathetic. Love his brothers. Be compassionate and humble. It's like boom, 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 boom. And each one of these are huge. Five exhortations to maintain our relationships within the church. Um, live in harmony. That means to be like-minded. The word is the same word that's used in Philippians 2 when, when uh, Paul says, have the same attitude, have the, the same mind as Jesus Christ. To live in harmony, to be like-minded, to, to share in Jesus' attitude. And you know, we may disagree about a lot of things. You know, favorite colors, things like that. I mean, which team, which Sports team to be root for, although Patriots come up. I mean, but but we can disagree on a lot of things. Can we live in harmony though we disagree? Absolutely. Because when we look at living in harmony, having the same mind, having the same aim and the same purpose, and when we agree with Jesus together, we automatically come in harmony with one another. And we all have our our, our favorite everything's. That's okay. There's a richness and a diversity that we can have in terms of our own personal tastes, our own cultural heritages, and, and so forth. But when it comes to living in harmony, Peter is saying we need to agree with Jesus and come into harmony that way. Choose to have the same aim and purpose, to love and serve Jesus above everything else. To reject individual self-interest. To reject the, uh, the, the consumerism that is so much a part of our culture today. And say, no, we're serving Jesus and we're in this together. And we've got, you know, God has given us, uh, you know, a purpose together as a church. To see our communities um, redeemed by the love of Christ. You know, it's particularly appropriate today, this, this exhortation to live in harmony, when the church in America has been divided. This past year has been a very challenging year. There have been divisions politically because people disagree. There have been divisions around the pandemic. You know, do we wear a mask, don't wear a mask? You know, how, how serious is it or not serious is it? Do, do you realize that the enemy can separate the church um, when we get lost in those mm -hmm. sidetracks? Mm -hmm. That Jesus is way more important than who we voted for in an election. That Jesus is way more important than whether we wear a mask or not. And, and that we can show our love to one another by caring for one another in, in our attitudes. And, and we need to be careful that we don't allow the enemy to cause the church not to live in harmony. Peter says, live in harmony. Then he says, be sympathetic. The word sympathetic means to suffer with. That we um, enter into... The, the same experience that other people can go through, though we may not, um, we may not have it or experience it. We can be sympathetic toward them. We can understand. We can uh, walk with them. You know, in in um, Romans chapter twelve, verse fifteen, it says, "Rejoice with those who rejoice, and mourn with those who mourn." And that when something good happens to someone, we can rejoice. And when someone's going through a difficult time, we can mourn with them. It means to feel another person's pain. It means to love them with a genuine love. So we be sympathetic to one another. And he says, um, love as brothers. Now, that's challenging. <laughs> Anyone who has siblings, 
knows that uh, sometimes, <laughs> you can say, you fight as brothers or fight as sisters. But when you get right down to it, when, you, when push comes to shove in a family, brothers and sisters love one another. And I agree. They love one another. And, and he's saying, be family. Family members can disagree, they can argue, but in the end, they work through their problems and they love one another. And that's what Peter is saying. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the churches he was writing to in Asia Minor. But we know that they were going through difficult times, that there was persecution coming toward them. And, and there could be a variety of responses. And so Peter is saying to the whole church, these are things are important. Live in harmony. Be sympathetic with one another. Um, love as brothers. Act as family together. Be compassionate. Compassion means with passion. That we love with a fervency. That we are willing to show mercy and grace toward one another. You know, aren't you glad God's compassionate toward you? I mean, aren't you glad that God's compassions with his mercies are new every morning? And that, that even when we blow it, God shows compassion toward us. And he says, in the same way, we can be compassionate toward one another. Even when, we may be men, even when someone does something that gets us upset. I know a pastor once who said, you know, if someone steps on your toes, just say, ouch. <laughs> just say, ouch. In other words, you don't have to react. Um, they may not have done it on purpose. But compassion often results in acts of mercy and kindness, help alleviate the suffering of someone else. And, and, and when we take on that attitude and we say, I want to be compassionate toward people, you know, it changes things. And then be humble. To be conscious that God is God and that we are not. That's a challenging thing. How many people have ever thought, boy, if I was in charge, <laughs> <laughs> they just elected me. <laughs> God, just give me five minutes and I'll get these things fixed. You know? Yeah, I, I thought that once. <laughs> it doesn't work. Because God's God and we are. And that's a good thing. And when we recognize that, that's humility. Humility is, is recognizing who we are in Christ. Humility is not beating yourself up. It's not getting down on yourself and saying, I'm no good. That's not humility. Humility is to think of ourselves and to think of other people the way Jesus sees them. It's to think in a proper way. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, um, Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought. And he says, think with sober judgment. That word sober literally is the same word for saved. It means to think with a saved mind. And so we look at ourselves through the lens of redemption. Jesus has redeemed me. I got my issues. I got my problems. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect either. But God has redeemed us. And we can walk with a humility knowing that I am who I am in Christ. And that he has given me a measure of grace, as it says in Romans 12. And then with that measure of grace, you know, I can serve God shoulder to shoulder with people that God has placed me in covenant with. And when we do that, we don't have to worry about whether someone does it better than me. I want people on my team who do it better than me. <laughs> who minister better than me. Don't you? Don't you want to win? In Christ? So I don't think anyone on the Buccaneers was sad that they had Brady on their team. <laughs> uh, particularly when they get a ring on their finger, right? The same thing is true with the church. That when we walk in humility, there is strength in that. Unbelievable strength. Because when we are weak, he is strong. And then Paul, uh, Peter goes on in verse 9, and he shifts his focus. This was to the church, and now he shifts his focus to the church in their relationship with the wider community. 
with the people that are insulting them, with the people that are rejecting them, that are that are uh, forbidding them to be a part of trade unions, that are in the fucking first century, uh, that, that that are ridiculing them, that that are um, you know trying to charge the Christians with evil in order to get even with them because they don't you know they're they're angry with God, and and this is what the early church in Asia Minor was putting up with it. And so Peter writes to them and he says, this is how you are to treat those people in your cities who are treating you wrongly. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called that you may inherit a blessing. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard to bless someone who has just insulted you, who has just gossiped against you, who has just done something to trip you up, who has, you know, uh, given you the cold shoulder. It's hard to release a blessing. It's a lot easier to say, I don't get mad, I just get evil. Right? We've all said that. Because in our fallen nature, there's something about revenge. Mm -hmm. That feels good. And, and Peter is, is really reflecting the teaching of Jesus in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, where Jesus says, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. That's what Peter is saying here. That revenge is not a part of God's economy. In the first century, revenge, you know, you could actually take revenge legally on people. And, uh, and we live in a, in a culture right now in our nation where um, there are laws uh, that apply to people who do evil. And we have to trust in our court system. But private revenge is never something that the Bible has ever taught. And that God says, vengeance is mine. It doesn't belong to me, it belongs to him. Why? Because God's desire is to release a blessing in the earth, not a curse. And it's the blessings of God that turn the curse. And so Peter says, don't seek revenge, release God's blessings. And when we do that, we demonstrate the love of God to people who don't deserve it. Did we deserve the love of God when Jesus was pursuing us? No. And so when we literally release the love of God and bless those who are enemies, love them, care for them, um, do not turn evil for evil or insult for insult, but rather blessing, then we align ourselves in God's kingdom and God says we inherit a blessing. There's blessings in that. Now, I already talked a bit about a blessing. Um, blessings are powerful. The blessing of God toward us releases things in us. But when we bless other people, we release the power of God into that situation. It's not just simply our words. It's not just correcting our attitude. It's not trying to manipulate people and make them feel guilty so that they come to Jesus. We are literally releasing the power of the Holy Spirit into that situation when we declare blessings. We release the power of God. We release the power of the spoken word that aligns with God's kingdom and what he wants to do. That's why Jesus said, you know, you can speak to that mountain and say, go into the ocean. You know, there's, there's power when we align with God's will and we declare it in our speaking. That's why we sing in worship. Not because we sing so well and everyone around us wants to hear us. You know, you can sing lousy. Sing. It releases something. There's power in the spoken word to undo the curse of the enemy. When we love our neighbors, we release the power of forgiveness. When we love our enemies, 
We release the kingdom of God into that situation. There's the power of acceptance and affirmation that comes from our words. There's the power of the gospel. And people may respond to it in a variety of ways, but even if they respond negatively, I look at that and say, hallelujah, because there's no response. The worst response is no response at all. That's why Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, to me in a hot or cold. I wish you were one or the other. But, but inheriting the blessings of God is so, so important. Because the blessings of God can flow through us to somebody else. You know, um, there are so many examples of Christians in history. I'm thinking of Corey Temple and the blessing that she released. And, 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 and a, one of the guards that, that railed against her became a Christian because of how she responded. You know, Richard Warbrand saw some of the guards in, in his prison cell become Christians because of his response in that ugly situation. So when Christians are accused and maligned and ridiculed, excluded, because of their faith in Christ, their response releases the power of God. Now, do you think that's happening today in our, in our culture? Is it possible for Christians to be to be maligned and ridiculed and so forth? Has that ever happened? Nah. <laughs> yeah. We may find that it happens even more. But that's okay. Because God is working in the midst of all that, and our response releases the power of God. Now, Peter backs this up with quoting from Psalm 34, where, you know, he, uh, he quotes uh, four verses, and he says, you know, whoever, the psalm says, whoever would live, love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil, his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. You know, the idea is the same thing. That God wants us to walk in a different attitude and spirit than a culture around us. Love our neighbors. Don't trade insult with insult. Don't be involved in, in, in doing evil to someone who did evil to you. But rather, um, keep our tongue from evil, our lips from deceit. So important today. And that, you know, that, that goes for Facebook. You know, it's so easy to type out our frustrations. <laughs> uh, to post something. You know, pray about it before you post it. Um, because God says, if we want to walk in the way of Jesus, we need to be willing to, um, uh, to pursue peace and goodness and righteousness. And when he uses the word righteous here, he talks about someone who's in the right relationship with God. And, and this quote in verse 12 ends with God's eyes and ears. God's watching the righteous. He's watching over them. His ears are open to their prayer. In other words, we don't have to take things into our own hands. We don't have to seek our own revenge. We don't have to get even with people who did something to us. We can bless them. We can release the power of the gospel into their lives. Um, we can be a witness for the goodness of God. No matter how they respond, God calls us to do that. And when we do that, we inherit a blessing. Peter captures, in these few verses, he captures the heart of our church covenant. And, um, and this is the time of year where we just uh, renew our covenant. Normally, we would have everyone in the sanctuary we would sign it together. Um, we would go downstairs and have uh, lunch and so forth. We can't do that. Well, those of you who are watching on Facebook, and, and I've emailed out the covenant. Um, some people say they can't open it, so I'll resend re re it. But, uh, but our covenant deals with these very things. The purpose of the covenant is to join together so that we understand what our aim and purpose is. We can live in harmony. We can have the same uh, goals in mind. 
And it talks about protecting the unity of our church and sharing the responsibility of ministry together, about serving uh, by releasing my gifts, and, um, and then supporting the testimony, the witness of our church as a family. And, um, and, you know, most of us are very, very familiar with that. We've got some copies here for you to read through. But when we sign that, we're basically saying, I want to live together with other Christians in this area to fulfill God's purposes. And we do that intentionally every single year. Just as Paul, or as, sorry, as Peter was saying here, seek to live together in harmony. And when we do that, when we seek to be a blessing, we seek to bless even our enemies in Jesus' name. It changes things. It changes us, and it changes the environment. So, I want to ask you this. This week, when someone speaks evil against you, gossips, turns a cold shoulder, whatever, how are you going to respond? Will you release God's blessing to them? Will they see Jesus in you? Catch a glimpse of God's love? to how you respond to them. Remember that we are called to inherit God's blessings so that we can give those blessings to others. Amen? Let's uh, join together in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this teaching that you've given through your servant Peter. And help us, Lord, to really think about the implications of how do we live this out? How do we love our enemies? And Lord, the enemies that we know the names of are the hardest because they're the ones that hurt us. <laughs> Lord, help us to receive your blessing that heals, that changes our perspective. Help us, Lord, to release that blessing into this broken world that at least our corner of the world can begin receiving the healing and the redemption that you have for us in Jesus. We thank you. We ask, Lord, that you would just speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Does anyone have anything they want to share? We close out the service. Something on your mind? Response? Well, we are going to um, stop the Facebook and um, we're going to be dismissed into our annual meeting. And um, so just hang tight for a few minutes. Uh, say hi to one another.